Oh, you're live. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Crafty Max Live. Do we have to redo all of it? I guess we have to redo everything. Um, So we hit the go live button like 90 seconds ago. And usually it takes, I don't know, five seconds-ish to go live. But you know what? It decided not to do that today. So that's all right. I guess I'll just start over. So um, today we will be talking about encryption. Uh, This topic was not rushed together, but we had to do it fairly late in the week because originally we were going to do Shakespeare, but we couldn't find a guest for Shakespeare, and obviously the Shakespeare guest would be someone who knows a bit more about the subject than we do because, you know, I've read Macbeth, like, for school and stuff, but that's kind of it. So, yeah, yeah, you might have seen a tweet from Ravi Max twitter where i said like we're gonna do shakespeare today we're not we're gonna we're good okay we're gonna do encryption instead uh and that was a scheduled tweet because i kind of scheduled a like month or no i scheduled like the rest of the season so kind of like a month of tweets um so that i don't have to be on twitter all the time (laughs) because who wants to be on twitter all the time (laughs) um but uh yeah so that's kind of it uh, we don't have any guests today, which is fine. We try to have guests, but when we can't get a guest, we can't get a guest. So, yeah, we're just going to do the episode. Um, yeah, all right. Yeah, so, so I'm recording off of my phone. Uh-huh. So I'll be looking at all you right. yeah, down yeah, here. Exactly. So it's a lower angle than y'all are used to. So. All right, so this video is not intended for children under 13 years old. If you are under 13 years old, please do not watch this video as the topics we discuss are meant for those with at least a high school level of education. If you are not 13, you will not understand the scientific topics discussed in this video. I tried to go fast like a medicine commercial. Um, You might have noticed that the thumbnail does not contain the disclaimer. Uh, The disclaimer has slowly been shrinking in the thumbnail because you know what? It's our thumbnail. We want thumbnail space. Disclaimer cannot capitalize on thumbnail space. So instead, we'll be having this auditory thumbnail at the beginning of each episode. But keep in mind, this rule still stands. We are still um, like PG-13, I guess you could say. for COPA laws and blah, blah, blah. But yeah, we're just going to be saying the disclaimer from now on instead of putting it in the thumbnail. So, all right. Yeah. We do have some chat already. Oh, wow. Already some chat. Let me check out the chat. Ooh, yeah, Jam. Jam says flash shirt. Fastest man Rep. alive. That is hilarious. Rep the shirt. Yeah. Um, I like the flash shirt. I guess Thank you've been you. getting heat on social media. I was getting before. heat, yeah. Uh, for the flash shirt. So, <laughs> oh boy. Anyways, um, I don't know. yeah, so uh, visit the Gravity Max website. I have a book preview for A Truly Dead Rock and the link, you know, for Amazon. You can buy that book. Uh, it's my sci fi. I'll talk about it in a second. Uh, I also have a timer up for the release of A Bottled Up Flame, which will be the sequel to A Truly Dead Rock. And it's going great. I have, I'm on the fifth, or kind of, I'm on the sixth chapter out of 15 of the third draft. So I've just been going through editing this. And I think it's shaping up to be a pretty good book. I think it's pretty fun. I've enjoyed writing it so far. Um, So let's see what else. Oh, yes, also, follow Gravity Max on social media. We've got uh, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And links for those are in the description below. I post, you know, updates like we have the show today. I also post, like, cool science stuff. I posted about an hour ago about this, like, cool uh, dragon to ISS, like, docking simulation game. Like, you try to dock it yourself. I did not dock it correctly, I guess. (laughs) Um, Uh, Are they docking, like, right now? Like, they are currently docked. They docked at like. They docked. Okay. okay. Yeah, they docked at ten sixteen, a.m. Eastern Standard Time, seven sixteen Pacific. Um, yeah, it was pretty cool. I watched it. Nice. They, it's funny. They docked and then it took like two hours to get on the, uh, space station, which you know reminds yeah. me of any airplane flight where they trap you on the plane for hours. You ever get that? It's so annoying. Yeah. At the airport, and you're like, can I just get off this plane? Uh. Like, I, I, 
no claustrophobia for the whole flight, but the instant we land and like 30 minutes go by and they're like, sorry, folks, we have a delay. We can't let you off yet. I instantly go like, I can't be trapped. These walls are closing in on me. So yeah. Uh, so yeah, links in the description. Pretty fun. I would check out the uh, ISS docking game. It's pretty fun. I think the physics work, like the physics of the game are pretty cool for like space because it's not intuitive because on Earth, because of like air resistance and you know gravity and ambient things around, when you like move something, it tends to come to a halt. You know, it tends to like if you slide something across the table, it stops. Um, and like when you're in a car, you need to constantly press on the accelerator to keep it going. But in space, when you accelerate, you just keep it because you're in a vacuum. So it's a pretty cool game that demonstrates the physics. Um, all right, so next plug slide, we've got Sebastian. Follow Sebastian on social media. We've got Instagram and Twitter, and then we also have his YouTube channel, 128 Seconds, with the updated logo, of course. Um, yeah. And yeah. And I landed a collab with Futurology. Oh, you did? So yeah. that will be coming probably not this week, but next week. That's great. Yeah, we had a collab uh, as Gravity Max like a few weeks, like a month ago, I'd say. Um, yeah, check that out too. Check out all this stuff, ton of science educational content. Sebastian releases another video every Wednesday. They're, they're so great. Like they're, you know, they're concise, 128 seconds. That's about two minutes. So, uh, explains the topic pretty well, I would say. Uh, Thank next you. we have a truly dead rock available on Amazon. If you're bored during quarantine, you know, you want something to read. It's about 314 pages long and it's a science fiction novel it takes place in the year 2102. And it's pretty fun, yeah. Um, so yeah, that's it. All right, encryption. Yeah, and we've moved the characters back to the title slide, and yeah. we're doing that now because we no longer have to deal with the space that the disclaimer takes. So Good. yeah. So this thumbnail that I designed over here is kind of a reference to Watch Dogs. If you've ever watch underscore dogs, oh, okay. watch, if yeah. you've ever played, that's such an old meme. Mm -hmm. But um, if you've ever played that game, it's all about hacking, right? And hacking deals with data, and encryption does as well. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty much what we're going to be talking about. Um, through history, people say that knowledge is the most important thing. Knowledge is power, right? Yep. So obviously, you're going to have people trying to get that knowledge and mm -hmm. get that data. So what people have taken to doing is hiding that data in interesting ways which is what we're going to talk about today yeah, yeah encryption is like anti-hacking um it's an interesting mm -hmm. sort of thing because you kind of got to like abstractify i don't know if that's a word like you kind of got to look back like exit the human perspective as much as you can and you got to think it's interesting that we as humans have the need to hold some information from like public knowledge like we need, in, like, for society to operate, really, we need some information to only go between two individuals. Um, and you think there might be alien societies where that's just not the case. We're just, like, they're all telepathic and, like, everyone knows every thought of everyone else the instant it happens, which is just an interesting thing to think about. Um, but, yeah, as humans, we need encryption. And, yeah, that's, that's kind of what encryption does. It keeps messages secret. Um, in the modern day, we talk about it in reference to computers mostly, uh, but as you'll see, there are there have been many methods throughout his for the invention of the computer. So that's what we're going to talk about. Yeah. So of course, we're going to start off with the history of yeah. encryption or the history of whatever we talk about because yeah. that's how we <laughs> organize our slides. Yeah, not always, but quite a quite usually. A yeah. Actually, next week. Next week's a big history topic, right? That Let week. me check the schedule. Yeah, let's. See. I'm excited. The topic. Schedule topic says. Is it the history? That... Yes, it is. It yes. is a big history. Okay, one. this is gonna be a fun one. Um. Yeah, well, we'll t but we'll save that for next week. We got to keep you guys coming back. So. <laughs> and yes. we have a very good guest. That oh, we will yeah. reveal later. Yeah, it'll be it'll be fun. We're going to have a It'll fun show next time. Um, not to say that this one won't be fun, but, you know, uh, it's always, what is it? More the merrier, right? 
So yeah, let's 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 begin. So we start with the Dude. Caesar cipher, which you may know from Gravity Falls. If you have watched that show, um, I like that show, so that's why I yeah put references in. Um, it was it was a goat of the show. Yeah, great. yeah, it was a big theme, I guess you could say. It was a big Easter egg. Um, so the Caesar cipher is probably one of the simplest ciphers, like the simplest forms of encryption, I would say. Um, and I assume because it's called the Caesar cipher, right, they used it back in Rome for relaying messages during warfare. I can um, fact check that. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that's... Um, yeah. Um, example, history usage. Um, yeah, Julius Caesar created it. Okay. Yeah. He's the so, inventor of it. Yeah, so this is... Obviously, we still have the Latin alphabet as English speakers, so this applies to English as it did to Latin. And what the cipher would do is you would lay out the letters of the alphabet in alphabetical order, obviously. Um, and so then you would like write your message and then the cipherer, I don't know, to, to cipher the message. The you, encryptor. Encryptor, to encrypt the message. Um, I think encrypt, decrypt, yeah. So to encrypt the message, what you would do is you would take the letter and then move it three letters back, I believe, right? Um, yep. Or was it the other way around? No, um, yeah, you would push it three letters forward to decipher it. Yeah, yeah to, to decipher put it, it yeah. three letters back. So you write like, I don't know, A, B, C would become D, E, F, basically. Um, and so this works pretty well at first, just like kind of with anything, sort of like you think evolution of like bacteria versus antibacterial medicine sort of thing. It's like an arms race. So at first when this came out, this was really effective because people would receive, if you look on the left, that is an enciphered message. And that just looks like nonsense. So they'd be like, oh, Romans must be crazy. Um, oh well, what do we do? Um, but then people eventually like caught wind and were like, hey, wait a minute. If you go three letters back to decipher it, it actually spells out very specific messages. So now if you wanted to send a secret message, the Caesar cipher would probably be one of the worst methods to use to encipher your text um, because it's just so known. That's sort of the problem. Um, kind of like, you know, bacterial resistance, kind of like we need a new flu shot every year, um, same sort of thing with enciphering and deciphering things. So that's pretty interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah. But if you want but, to send yeah, secret yeah. messages, like if you want to pass notes in class, um, as much as that doesn't exist anymore, because <laughs> if you want to pass notes in class, just text the person outside of the Zoom call. But uh, traditionally, <laughs> if you wanted to pass notes in notes in class, you could probably get away with the Caesar cipher because what teacher is going to think that it's the Caesar cipher, you know? Um, <laughs> so I never did it. I never had, I, I don't think people pass notes in class anymore. I think that's just a trope that they used in movies from over 30 years ago. What do you think? Yeah. I think um, I did friend. I ever pass notes in class? I've never like, um, felt the need. I did. Oh, you in did? like in first grade, and then I got like busted for it. Oh, we because had one teacher don't say the name, but we had yeah. one teacher. I think. I think we did. I I was like, I don't know. I just wrote a message to mm -hmm. my friend, and all it said was "You're fat," right? Because I was a comedic genius back then, mm -hmm. and I, like the the teacher saw it. You know, or like I'd written it on the back of like a worksheet, which I had the hand in anyways. So like I, I passed it to him. He was like, thanks. And he passes it back. Right. And then I like do the work. I turn it in. She, you know, why did you why did you write this? You know, because all it says is fat. Uh, you know, sometimes you got to do whatever you can for the common. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, passing notes in class. I, I usually. Whatever I wanted to say, I could usually hold on to for like 30 minutes or however long it takes for class to end. Um, so, yeah. 
I don't even remember what what the name of my the, our first grade teacher was. You don't remember? I remember her name specifically. I did not particularly like this teacher. I'm going to be very tepid on that. Um, um, I was not that much of a fan. Uh, I don't know. I don't remember. You don't remember? I'll, I'll, I'll you can tell me off I'll stream. tell you after. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think we don't want to... I think that's like libel or whatever. You can say whatever you want as long as you don't name the person. But even so, without naming the person, I am being fairly tepid. Uh, so, yeah. Um, the Caesar well, Cipher, it's, it's really simple. Um, but it's one of those things named after Julius Caesar, like the month of July, which is interesting. Um, but, yeah. Oh, and then, of course, there are variants of the Caesar Cipher as well, because you don't need to specifically do three letters back or forwards. You could do two, one, 13. Uh, theoretically, you could do up to 25 because that would just be like the equivalent of doing one letter in the other direction. Um, and 26 would just be kind of <laughs> nothing because you've just written the same thing. Um, but yeah, so that's that's the Caesar cipher. Uh, yeah. All right. Let's go to the next slide. All right. So, so this is some, yeah, subliminal messaging. So you hear this with, like, advertisement and with other stuff. But um, what it is is it's putting a message in your brain that you subconsciously recognize, and it's not directly, like, out there. So a good example of this is, um, here, I'll, I'll go with the top right one. So the top right one is the painted on the Sistine Chapel. Michelangelo painted that, right? And, like, everyone knows this painting. It's one of the most, if not the most famous painting. I guess that would be the most. But yeah. one of the most famous paintings um, of all time. But if you look at the cloak behind the depiction of God, it's in the shape of a human brain. Mm -hmm. um, like the red cloak behind him. It's got, like, the lobes in the back. It's got the cerebellum coming off. And like all of that, or I guess that would just be the occipital lobe coming off and then the brain stem coming down. Um, and this was theorized that he did that because of the church's denial of science. Mm. So he was putting a little nod towards that in that. And another, here, the bottom right is also a work by Michelangelo. Mm -hmm. That's, um, I think that's Pope Julius II, I think. I might be wrong on that. But, um, basically Michelangelo didn't like this guy, but the Pope was like, draw me, you know, uh, on the Sistine Chapel. So, and th this is where this also is. So, he did, and he drew these two angels sitting behind him, but the hand sign that one of the angels is making at him is, was the equivalent of, like, flipping him the bird, basically, in ancient Italy. That's so, there you yeah. go. And, uh, yeah, if you want, this is, so the Last Supper on the left, probably one of the more famous paintings. Um, this was painted by Leonardo da Vinci, and recently, like, as recently as, like, 2014, I think, um, someone postulated, what if there's, like, a hidden musical score based on circular objects in the thing? So, um, it's like some of the apostles' faces, or the, like the bread on the table, um, when you put it along notes, or when you put it along like sheet music, and you play it backwards, because I don't know if that's how they did music back then or whatever, but when you play it backwards, it actually makes a rhythm that sounds like a church, like church music, you know? That's really interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, we can yeah. leave the link to that in the description if okay. you guys want to see it. Yeah, yeah, just send me the link to that. That's really interesting. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I really like the brain one because it's like, it kind of be like saying like knowledge is God or something like that. Like the yeah. knowledge, like truth dying, is the only God. You know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, so that's really interesting. Um, and of course, there are also like more modern examples. Um, as you said, in advertising. Also, there were a lot of claims, although this is, you know, um, 
also having to do with religion, interestingly, is like in the 60s and 70s when like concerned parents, concerned mothers usually, I would say, concerned Christian mothers would, would say like rock and roll music has satanic messages in it. And um, like, I think they would burn like Beatles, like music, like however they had you. I don't know if this was records time or mm-hmm. like whatever stage of playing music, they would like burn all these um, like music players. And so, which is interesting. And it's interesting because I think they actually did put like backwards messages in some of their songs, but they were jokes. Um, so they were kind of leaning into it, like saying like, ha ha. Yeah. Um, so that that's pretty interesting. Although this like, is not the case, like probably not the case, um, but it was sort of like a conspiracy theory that was spread around in this time period. Um, so yeah, that's that's that. Yeah, so this is, I, I think this is one of the coolest ways, you know, yeah. because um, actually, oh, I could have put this in. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the teasers for Avengers Endgame before anyone knew what the title of the movie was, um, the director or someone that worked on it, like the director or the producer, they took a picture of a stage mm-hmm. and that was it. And then they uh, uploaded it to Twitter, Facebook, Insta, all that. And eventually people noticed that some of the objects, if you drew lines along the, ob- along the objects, they spelled out the word endgame, huh. you know, um, I can, I, I can pull that up. I could throw that That's in. That's interesting. Yeah. Real quick. Yeah. I really like this one too, when it's used for good or at least neutral purposes. Um, Cause you know, they say it can be used for like bad, but I find it interesting because it's very creative. Um, and It isn't even like, because, you know, Caesar Cypher is very formulaic, you know, like it's a specific way of doing it. But subliminal messaging, it's it's like, especially in art, it's sort of like artists, like adding meaning and character to their art. And it's it's really interesting, like, you know, in these paintings, in music, you know, 60s, 70s. Um, And so I, I find that really fun because it's sort of like, sort of like you're sharing an inside joke with the painter or musician, which is pretty great because these are some pretty notable figures. So it's fun to like feel like you're connecting. So yeah, are you finding that tweet? Oh, I'm like very close to finding it, but they just really don't want to give it to me. Give me one second to do that. All right. I'm on um, some British website. Mm-hmm. Give me one sec. This, okay. okay. Yeah, Jamie, pull that picture up. Yeah, basically. Yeah, the yeah. Russo brothers, who are the directors of it, okay. posted, tweeted this out. Okay. Let me exit the presentation and then represent. Look hard. Oh, okay. So you got an E on the side with the shelves, the top left. The N, I guess, would be the, that, you know, with the balcony over. Hmm. I wonder where the G would be. The A is the ladder. And then the E is like that door on the side. Yeah, M is, I don't know where M is. Yeah. But yeah, so this is another thing of subliminal messaging. And this is when we found out that the name was going to be Endgame. Mm-hmm. So, you know, but it can be used to, um, you know, convey information that's much more important than the title of a movie, yeah. you know. Um, like, I'm sure in modern graffiti or modern artwork like street art that you see there's like subliminal messages in there um yeah. also i think there was a um you know that video of the like vietnam like prisoner of war and he's like saying oh like this is all fine but then he's blinking like he's blinking yeah torture, um over and over again which is pretty interesting 
So yeah, and, or we when we talked about um, music with Zach, mm-hmm. um, Shostakovich was oh, yeah. with with the music. He like wrote his name in the music, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or he made pieces that like reflected his political views, mm. which is like nutty. Yeah. But yeah, it's all it's all just subtleties, you know. Yeah. Yeah, and then also, I guess it can be used for negative purposes if, like, you have an advertisement. Say there's, like, color theory, which is, like, that the McDonald's, for instance, like, red and red and yellow, like, make you hungry, apparently. Yeah. Um, I'm not, like, feeling that hungry. Flash, shirt, flash but, shirt, yeah. Maybe the <laughs> white cancels it out. But, um, but, like, they say red and yellow is supposed to make you hungry. So that if you go to a McDonald's, like, just seeing the colors, like, in your brain, like, triggers hunger. And then you're like, oh, I gotta, I gotta get some McNuggets or something. Um, so, yeah, that's interesting. It can be used for advertising purposes. So, yeah, I think yeah. Uh, that's it. Uh, let's go to the next slide. And this yeah. Is- yeah. yeah, this one, we both read a book on this. Yep, I think what, um, what was it seventh grade? I believe was when I read this book. My, I have no memories no before memory. Friday, so <laughs> the um, last Thursday. Yeah. yeah, you know that one. Uh, hmm. Have you heard of that last Thursdayism? It's basically the theory that the world was created last Thursday. It's just that every memory and like evidence of stuff before then, it was created as is like that it's kind of a joke um mm. as an un- unprovable theory type thing uh but yeah sorry continue but yeah um yeah so these are the navajo code talkers so in world war ii and we're going to talk about it a lot because there needed to be a lot of code going on because it was tricksy germans but I the this um, one was actually used in the pacific theater more Yes, well, yes, yeah, but I'm just saying that the Germans was the Enigma machine, which we're going to talk about later. But yes, this was used primarily against Japan. So you're right on this. Um, After Pearl Harbor got bombed, um, obviously the U.S. was like, I'm in, you know. So we went to war, um, we helped out our allies in Europe, and we forged our own war with Japan, you know. And that was bad you know um bad and like casualties were high and every battle was brutal you know like the most famous picture of war ever the guys with the flag Mm -hmm. that's from um the battle of so uh a japanese island i get the name but um yeah so there became a need for um encryption Mm -hmm. in like military orders and stuff because the japanese winning um like battles they they didn't really win any significant ones if i remember correctly but they did like take soldiers hostage they would ambush troops and steal their um you know orders and stuff and some of them were fluent in english Mm -hmm. so they could like read you know what the orders were so there became a need for those orders to become you know decrypted Mm -hmm. and um, I don't know who had the idea, but someone yeah. came up with that the Navajo language, and this goes for any Native American language, is literally impossible to learn. It is, like, harder than Mandarin, harder than Cantonese, harder than any of that. If you aren't born, like, in, in the tribe, you will never learn the language. So this is basically a perfect code, yeah. you know? So... What they did is they enlisted all these Navajo um, soldiers. Um, And there was an increase after Pearl Harbor. Um, They started bringing them in because the idea had been circulating ever since the end of, like, World War I. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't until Pearl Harbor got bombed that they were like, let's use them. So they enlisted all these Navajo members, and they basically just put them on opposite sides. Some in America, some out on the field, so they could talk to each other. And, um, they had all these, like, code words for everything. They would usually just use the alphabet. That's what I remember from the book we read. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like, 
or or they would use analogies and stuff. like the Navajo word for potato was used for grenade, mm-hmm. you know, um, stuff like that, and the Japanese could intercept that the uh, or they could like hear the radio broadcast and they wouldn't understand like a word of it. Mm-hmm. And obviously, the Native Americans, the Navajos, could speak English as well, yeah, so they, they would translate. Them for their buddies but um basically the thing was was that before the nava it would take i don't know how long it was like 15 to 20 minutes to decrypt in um yeah, with what they were using uh-huh. but the navajos could send messages back and forth and decrypt them in two minutes because yeah. they all just spoke the language yeah like that's so, a problem yeah. because if if your key is too complicated like if you put 50 padlocks on your front door you're going to need a massive key ring and it's going to take you like an hour to get into your house to the point that it kind of like defeats the purpose of having security. Um, but yeah, yeah. So I, I, another interesting thing about this is that like Navajo and any of the Native American languages, like they were such a niche language, like very few people spoke these languages. So like Japan had had dealings with like the British Empire for, you know, centuries before this, you know, with the Dutch um and like various european countries right and so having this language that you know was unique to the americas and that you know the native americans didn't have like expeditions to other continents so it was like it was sort of like um there was no built immunity you could say kind of like with a virus um there was like no exposure to this language so they kind of had no idea what was going on which is Pretty interesting. Uh, the ba- Battle of Iwo Jima mm-hmm. is the famous picture with them planting yeah. the flag. Yeah, I know that picture. Um, and actually, three of the six soldiers that you see in that picture were killed during that battle. Oh, wow. That's interesting. Yeah. Let me pull up the book that we read, too. Uh, just yeah. to- anyone wants to read. I think it's just called Code Talkers. Oh, yeah, by 2011 Code Talkers. Let's see. Who is it by? Um, yep, okay, let's see. The Code Talker, the first and only memoir by one of the original Navajo Code Talkers of World War II by Chester Nez, it says. Um, yeah, I think that's right. Amazon. I, I remember, like, the cover kind of looks like it. Or maybe it was this one with the dog tags i don't know but if you're interested in this topic there it's on amazon so you can look for that um this other one code talker a novel about the navajo marines of world war ii uh joseph um uh so you can check that one out um yeah like these these are good reads i think um yeah especially yeah if you need any book recommendations you know you're bored in quarantine um, yeah, I, I remember it being really interesting. So, yeah. Um, so this is definitely okay. one of the most successful codes to mm-hmm. like ever work. You know, and the, th- the sad thing was, was that these, the Navajos were not credited with this until like way after the war mm-hmm. because both for like secrecy reasons and also, you know, America's racist has, well, in like in the past they were. Um, very intolerant of other people, so they feared that the the government feared that if they knew the public knew that the Native Americans had helped them win against Japan, morale would go down mm. or something like that. But yeah. I I don't know exactly what the rationale was, but it wasn't until I think maybe even after the Vietnam oh. that they got recognition. And by that time, so like some of them had already, you know, died mm. or some of that. And they got pay from the government, but it was like a thousand dollars, maybe. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah, I mean it's I mean, this was like a top secret thing. So and it, it was, so, yeah. It does it does tend to like take a while for the government to declassify files, but um yeah. So very interesting, very successful. Um, I would definitely recommend reading some books on this if you're interested. Um, do you have anything else? Should I go to the next slide? Um, I was just interested in learning what the 
name of the operation was. But, oh, yeah. Um, but uh, so here you go. Here's a quick summary. Um, this. Okay, here you go. The. Here, I'll read this thing. So. Every World War II combatant appreciated the need for an unbreakable code that would help them communicate while protecting their operational plans. The U.S. Marines knew where to find one, the Navajo Nation. Marine Corps leadership selected 29 Navajo men, the Navajo co Code Talkers, who created a code based on the complex, unwritten Navajo language. So it wasn't even, like, a written language. Um, the code primarily used word association by assigning a Navajo word to key phrases in military tactics. This system enabled the code talkers to translate three lines of English in 20 seconds, not 30 minutes, as yeah. was common with the code breaking machines that they had. So 20 seconds from 30 minutes is like, yeah, incredible. Yeah, crazy. Cause like nowadays a computer can like encipher and decipher like a, uh, you know, Caesar cipher or even more complex ones, like really easily, really quickly. But yeah, they had yeah. these machines where they would have to like, like pin the like, you know, they had to like attach these pins and with like wires between them, and like they had to like set, and it was just craziness. Um, yeah. so, the code talkers participated in every major marine operation in the Pacific theater, giving the Marines a critical advantage throughout the. During the nearly month-long battle for Iwo Jima, for example, six Navajo Code Talker Marines successfully transmitted more than 800 messages without error. Marine leadership noted after the battle that the Code Talkers were very critical to the victory at Iwo Jima. Um, and at the end of the war, the Navajo Code remained unbroken. Hmm. So, that's, that's, that's really successful. That's great. Um, yeah, 800 flawless messages just in one battle over the course yeah. of one month that's insane yeah and that was just with six dudes six dudes did all that you know so cool yeah yeah all right uh yeah so that's it for me should i go to the next slide sure all right so next slide we've got pattern recognition and so this is sort of a decryption uh deciphering and essentially what this is is that particularly in English right here, we have the commonalities of different letters written out. So, you know, V.978%, right? Um, and these may seem random, but if you know these facts, these figures, then something like a Caesar cipher can be easily figured out as long as you have, I don't know the number, but if you have anything over a few sentences long, you can probably crack it with just something like this. Um, and the reason for that, I mean, it's just the commonality. So in the Caesar cipher, right, if each instance of the letter E is coded as the letter H, then the frequency of the letter H will match the letter E. And then if you have the letter N, the letter Q, and so the frequency will match letter Q will match the letter T, you know? So, well, that's that's really interesting, I think. Um, and of course it isn't perfect, right? It's rough, especially in like a short piece of text. But from there, what you can do is sort of see like, okay, we have these three letter words and they always end with the most common symbol and the word itself is the most common word. That's gotta be the, obviously, right? So you can kind of use these methods of just looking at frequencies of letters, looking at frequencies of words, looking like in English, which letters are allowed to be double letters. Like we can have two L's and like such, right? Like you look at the patterns and- And such. And such. I just don't want to think of another one. Oh. Think of another one. Oh, there you go. Uh, so, <laughs> So the Caesar cipher is easily broken with just sort of like analytical reasoning. Um, I imagine the first guy to break the Roman Caesar cipher must have felt pretty smart. He's pretty good about himself. Just like, hey, uh, what, what, what would be an empire? Hey, Gauls. I don't know. Hey, Persia. That's what empire. I was going to say. Yeah. Look at this. I figured it out. That would be pretty cool. Um, but yeah, so... 
pattern recognition works on this level and not just for English. Uh, every language has these sort of patterns and frequencies of different letters being used. So, you know, like Spanish, French, um, even like languages that don't use the Latin alphabet, so like Mandarin, um, Russian, Greek. So it's, it's pretty interesting. Uh, let's see, what else can you do with pattern recognition? I mean, um, this actually fits perfectly into our next thing, which is the okay. Enigma machine. Um, so if you want to go to that, yeah, I could, yeah, yeah, I could. Yeah, so this is pretty simple. This is sort of something that you can do with thinking. It's kind of like solving a puzzle, I would say. But yeah, you can look at letters. You can also look at words, letter patterns. So it's pretty cool. So here we have Patrick yep. saying, the inner machinations of my mind are, you know, and what that is. So like an enigma is like a riddle, mm -hmm. you know, it's a puzzle or, you know, something that you need to decrypt. So in World War II, again, um, Enigma machines were invented and they were used. And basically there was this massive rush to break the Enigma machine, basically, because it's what the Germans were using to send messages back and forth between their camps. And even if the Brits won a battle and like got the notes, they would be like, what is this? Mm -hmm. You know? So eventually they got their hands on Enigma machines of their own. But they still had like no idea how they worked because there was always, um, it, it wasn't a random thing, but it was basically something for each individual Enigma machine and its receiver. So, how they broke it was with the help of a man named Alan Turing, right? And mm -hmm. Alan Turing was, Turing. yeah, 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 he, he was a genius, yeah, he was a genius. Um, yeah, his life is actually super interesting, and I might do 128 seconds on him. Yep. Um, he did not get the credit he deserved, especially mm. because uh, they gave him like the anti-gay pills mm. that made him like yep. shoot himself. Mm. So that sucks. Yep. But shout out, shout out to, was, to Alan. Yeah, he was in Britain, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I know. These he's got such a crazy like he's got the. There's the Turing test, which is supposed to be a test you give to an AI and, or well, it's kind of a test you give to a person, but you're testing the AI. And so the AI has to deceive a person into believing that the AI is another human being. And if it can accomplish that, then it's like a successful AI. It's passed the Turing test. Um, I don't think we have that yet. Like that can reliably like maybe an individual person it can it can deceive an individual person that isn't really thinking about it much but like you can dupe a person based on saying sort of like just not putting the idea of an ai in their mind but like if you have say a, a focus group like a thousand people talk to a ton of ais and real people and say some of these are ais some of these are real people uh which do you assign it to like in a study like that that's how the Turing test is supposed to be administered. And if a AI can pass that, then it's like a successful uh, sort of human level AI, which is pretty interesting. Yeah. So part of how they broke the Enigma machine was actually due to laziness. Oh. Because they intercepted this um, transmission, right? And it was all random letters. But someone noticed that like a certain pattern was repeating mm. you know um and it was because it was it was actually i remember the the italians because they had it was when they had first gotten the enigma machines from germany um britain began intercepting them from italy and what this italian operator had done was he just pressed like the l key over and over and over and over again to test the enigma machine and someone noticed that there was like a set pattern. Now it it wasn't like L; it was just H. So it wasn't just like H H H. Yeah. But it was like a pattern, you know, because it keeps like cycling. Yeah, it cycles. So what they used is they backwards. They found out that okay, this is the letter L, you know, because they just recreated it. They were like Q Q Q Q W until it, you know, spat out L, you know. Um. So using that, they 
were actually able to crack the entire Enigma machine wow. because of that one dude, because he had just sat there spamming it. Like, I think it was L. And that guy um, must have felt very dumb. Yeah. As opposed to why he broke the Caesar cipher. <laughs> yeah. So part of how it works is with prime numbers. Mm-hmm. So um, usually it would be like, it's kind of like a number to letter thing, but what they do is they take the number, they multiply them all by prime numbers and these prime, and it's like a very large prime number, like a 10 digit prime number that no one could like conceivably like recognize, you know, like if you just hold up what the number was after multiplying it by the 10 digit prime number, you have no idea what you can like divide that out by or whatever. Um, so, for each one, it was different, but because that dude had just spanned it, they were able to figure out what the prime number was, mm. you know, and they were able to break it for that. Yeah, like, I think what they did was, like, each month, they would put out, like, every day's code yeah. or something. Like, they would say, all right, this month, like, you'll have this code for the month or whatever. And even if, like, that was compromised, then, like, they had other ways of, like, like by the end of the month, right, it wouldn't be compromised anymore. So even if you like got their slip of paper or whatever it was that was like laid out their code for the month, by the end of the month, you'd be like, oh, well, we're back in the dark again. So, yeah, it was pretty interesting. Yeah. Yeah. All right. That's, that's it for me. But yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Now we move on to the uh, modern, modern day. day. Yeah. So today we have computers. We have technology to use another Patrick quote. Um, and so how, how do computers keep your data private? That's the question. Uh, so, you know, let's just jump right into it. We got random keys. And I believe you keyboard smashed this, correct? Yeah, I did. So, so yeah, so there are random keys. As I smash my keyboard again. Um, there are random keys that get assigned to pretty much whatever. Like, if you look, you can see on the screen, actually, you can see the little lock, you know, next to the docs.google.com, you know, uh, yeah. on the stream. That means it's, like, a secure connection. Mm-hmm. And basically HTTPS, what that means... right? Hmm? It's the HTTPS thing, right? The yes. Public, yes. That, that means that the SSL certificate has been, like approved you know it's good so what that is is that there are um two main kinds of certificates there are public certificates and there are private certificates public certificates is what decrypts all your or no is what encrypts your stuff you know so that's what assigns these random keys so then when you go onto a website um it checks you know it's like can we use your cookies you know um and it's it checks you know to make sure that their certificate their private certificate that's on their website is valid you know and if it is then it's like okay the, here is how you decrypt these random codes you know and then that's when the if the private certificate has been verified then it's able to access your data you know yeah so this is how it so basically no human ever knows what the random code is. You know, here I just have, it's like a set of five digit things, you know, yeah. for five letters, five numbers. Um, in reality, it could be whatever to whatever, you know? Yeah. What if you accidentally typed the nuclear launch codes and we're about to have our stream shut down? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> but, um, shut yeah. Down, well, I should intentionally shut down the stream now. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. yeah but um the beauty of it like i said is that no human ever has to know what the code is mm-hmm. you know it's all done by computers talking to each other so there are however ways to get these mm-hmm. decryption codes yeah. by faking a certificate um which is known as phishing if you send an email and it's like you won Mm. Enter your email. With a pH. That is fishing with the pH. Yes, it is. So it's like you win. 
you know, and your Joe Schmo is at his computer and he's like, I won, you know, and it's like, enter your email. And he's like, I'm entering my email. Um, once it does that, Wait, it has still that. falls for those? That's the question. Um, I think people still do, you it's know. So sad. Yeah. Like, but, I don't know because like they're getting refined. It's like fishing mm-hmm. is refined. It's oh, no okay. longer like you win. It's like this is your boss, Ooh, you know, okay. stuff like that. I like they'll that. fake a company email, mm-hmm. you know. Um, you just need to have um have a safe word with every single person you're in correspondence with, and like they have to include that in their email. Otherwise, um, you're like you are fake. That would yeah. be interesting, but. But, yeah, so, the, that, yeah, that's, that's the basics of how it works, you yeah. know. Um, so, isn't um, it, so, the public key and the private key, right, isn't it, like, two large prime numbers or something? And like, yeah, it might also function on that basis. Um, yeah, and, like, you have to yeah, multiply I can check them that. together. So, it's, like. You have this public prime number, right? And these are both large prime numbers. Um, and the public prime number is like, you know, any computer accesses it. Then you have your private prime number, and your private prime number is multiplied by the public prime number. And then that is your code number that you code the data by. So then when you send it to the website, the website, since they know the public number or whatever, like they're able to divide by that number or something like that. I forget exactly how it works, but... Um, yeah, that's that's going into programming, and at that point, I feel like it might actually be different based on each company, mm-hmm. because, like, Google would have different security than, like, Apple or any of those things. But what you're saying is the basics of how certificate matching works um, because it basically like copies itself and that copy goes out, then it multiplies with the uh you know, the private site's um certificate. Mm-hmm. And then there you go. Yeah. You got yourself some decryption and some encryption. Yeah. So basically the reason why this is kind of like uncrackable unless like someone steals the key from you, literally like that's what phishing would be, like they take the key from you. Um it's impossible to crack because like the amount of prime numbers you would need to test is like so large that like any traditional computer would take like thousands of years or something to figure it out. Like it would take forever. It would be trial and error. Like this one, no, this one, no, this one, no. Um, So uh, unless you have anything else, we can segue into the next thing, which is a possible breakdown of our entire modern encryption system, which would be a little chaotic. Uh, and that is the... Here, let me computer. open up my presentation for this. Mm-hmm. So this is the quantum computer. Uh, you may have heard of quantum computing before. It basically relies on quantum mechanics to execute computer operations. And it does it slightly differently from how, how our computers operate. The basic, like the fundamental thing is this. Um, a computer has a bit, like a computer runs on bits. And those bits can be in a state of either one or the state of zero. But a quantum computer runs on qubits instead of regular. Qubits, yeah. Qubits or I I found one of my friends. Yeah, qubits are in, they are quantum. So they are in a superposition of states. So it's not one or zero, it's one and zero in different proportions at the same time. It's kind of like Schrodinger's cat, both alive and dead at the same time. Your qubits are both one and zero at the same time. And that leads to some very interesting properties. Um, Yeah, yeah. so I I found my presentations. So Uh, I gave gave these presentations to Yale mm -hmm. when I was on the campus about um, how we can use superposition um, specifically to enhance our technology. And with the the quantum computer was the shining gem of this presentation. So it can um it's it can do multiple processes at once, it's faster and it can like it's capable of like factoring 500 digit numbers. Um so yeah, like you said a qubit um is 
in both zero and one at the same time. You know, it's like the yeah. beast of binary. Yeah, and that's but, the great thing. Um, oh, yeah, sorry. Continue. Yeah, so it's made of electrons, and electrons kind of exist in superposition. That's what Schrodinger found out, and that's what we've kind of observed with stuff like the double slit experiment, which we talked about all the way back in season one, episode three, quantum mechanics. Yeah. But um, yeah, so it basically, when you are trying to do anything on your computer, you need to wait for it for the zeros to change into ones or ones to change into zeros, right? But the thing is that with if it's run on qubits, it's already there, you know? Like, it's already there. You don't need to wait for anything. So it's pretty much instant execution. So it just... And so, yeah, it's also um, based on exponential growth. Yeah. So how it works now is, like, you have, like, bits, and then you have bytes, megabytes gigabytes you know i skipped kilobytes but um that's that's all additive you know like there's um eight bits to a byte there's however many bytes to a kilobyte i think it's 1024 and then it's 1000 all the way up um but each qubit is like two bits in and of itself so it becomes exponential Mm -hmm. so just 100 qubits can store 1.2 non-alien numbers, you know? Yeah, so it's, it's storage capacity. It's 2 to the 100 instead of... Exactly. Like 100, or well, no, it's 2 to the 100 instead of... I don't know what it would be. It's just two, 100, I guess. Yeah, two to the 100, 100 bits, which yeah. would be 100 divided by 8, which is... Yeah whatever whatever 12. that that many that many bytes yeah 12.5 bytes you know so very different um so yeah with like 50 qubits which is the ibm has a quantum computer that's it has yeah that's the picture it has 50 qubits in it that's estimated to be the standard size so you have 2 to the 50th power bits which is 140,737 gigabytes or 140 terabytes Hmm. if you are you know a savage right now you might have a terabyte drop yeah this has 140 you know so an entire new medium to like 32 bit or something 64 bit like i have a 64 bit like whatever quantum computer 10 years from now yeah so with that much data and i calculated all of this out like a while ago with that much data, 140 terabytes, you could install 14,000 copies of Red Dead Redemption 2. You could download 44,500 copies of Shrek. You could use your computer to launch 140,000 Apollo 11 mission. <laughs> um, you could stream music nonstop for 128, there you go, 0. 0.5 years. Wow. Um, and you could download the entire universe, which is all movies, shows, and canonical websites, Mm -hmm. 1,223 times. So, it's a lot of data. That, that is a lot of data. Um, you couldn't do all that. You could do each individual one. You couldn't do, like, all. Yeah, not all at the same time. But, But, yeah. This, or, or, or. And and that's interesting, because... Uh, we get into Boolean logic gates, which are an interesting yeah. thing. Uh, and they work entirely differently for quantum computers. So in standard computing, your Boolean log- logic gates will be like not gate, and gate, or gate. And the simple, these are just the simple ones. So what the and gate will do is it will produce an output of one only if both of its inputs are one. So if you have a one and a zero, zero and a zero, it outputs zero, but one and a one gives you one. Uh, Then you get an OR gate, and this is an inclusive OR gate. So what happens is if you have a zero and a zero, you end up with zero. But if you have a one and a zero, well, one of them, you know, this or that, so you get a one. And if both of them are one, then you also get a one. And the NOT gate inverts it, so if you put in a zero, you get out a one. If you put in a one, you get out a zero. 
Uh, and then there are more complex gates and you can also combine these gates. And that's how like simple calculators run. You can actually program a simple calculator with just like AND gates and OR gates um, to do like addition or something. And so with quantum computers and these qubits, it gets wacky because superpositions can be described by like orientation. So it's like a vector like pointing in the direction of like one, but like a little bit slanted so that there's an aspect of zero in it, like really weird things that like don't make sense intuitively. Um, but then you get these Boolean, like these quantum logic gates where they say rotate the qubit or something like that. And that is just crazy. That is like so weird. Yeah. So yeah. So yeah, when this comes out, nobody's email is safe mm -hmm. because before this comes out, everyone will have to have an extreme level of encryption, you know? Yeah. And because like this thing sh will shred emails, you know. Yeah. Like you could get into every government. Yeah. At once, you know. It's like so powerful and I don't know. I like I like it because yeah, if, I like it. if if we can start using, you know, quantum mechanics to our advantage, then we we run the universe. You yeah. know, because there's so much we don't understand. Mm -hmm. That's cool. We could just use it. Yeah. You know, we could be like, we don't know why it works, but yep. here we go. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's interesting. Um, specifically for the case of like modern cryptography, the way that it breaks it is that traditionally with such a large prime number that you need to factor, you would have to try like so many different, or a co-prime number that you need to factor. You have to try so many different like possible divisors and each time it, it'll be like, is it divisible by this? No, by this, no, by this, no. And it would take forever to get that, yes. But with quantum computers, what you do is you ask every question at the same time and it gives you back one value of yes and that one value of yes is associated with one input and the result is you know you've broken the code which is so crazy so it like it knows like it's it's sort of like a sieve like a sifter like you're panning for gold or something um it's able to sift out all of those no answers and leave you with that one yes answer, and then you've broken modern cryptography. So, yeah. So that's it for me. You got anything? Yeah, that's all I got. All right. We can move on to what yeah. the future yeah, so of the encryption future. is. So, uh, much like lava, the quantum computer destroys, but it also creates. This is an mm. interesting sort of thing. A lot in like Hawaii and like Polynesia, right? Um, they're like gods related to volcanoes and lava are both like destructive and creative forces because ash, like lava, like cooled lava ash tends to be like the best fertilizer. So like plants grow really well after lava comes in and destroys everything. So that is my metaphor for quantum computers right here because there is a quantum cryptography protocol. And so it's really complicated. I don't really understand it. I just know that it works. <laughs> so it uses the quantum computer to create a new sort of encryption protocol, which is really great because, you know, if it just, dis it's kind of like that sort of cat and mouse thing I was talking about earlier with like the convergence sort of like the evolution, bacterial resistance, uh, quantum computers get rid of old encryption, but they also allow you new methods of encryption because these qubits are so powerful that you can use them for cryptography as well as decryptography. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so yeah, this breeds an entire new type of like encryption which would be necessary for you know the quantum computer and probably even need to be better you know yeah. but yeah. in the past like apollo 11 was launched with like a negligible amount of data mm -hmm. you know like they always say like less data that's on your phone mm. 
Um, so a gigabyte back then was like, what are you ever going to use that much data for, sir? You know, and now it's like, like my Xbox has two terabytes on it. My computer has yeah, I have a fifteen gigabyte lot. Google Drive for free. That's what I have. Yeah, yeah, a free fifteen gigabyte. Like in in yeah. the sixties, seventies, would have been. What? Like you what? What is this madness? Yeah, let me, let me Did see you use it on your trips to the moon? Oh wait. <laughs> Did you use it on your oh, flying wait. car? Oh no. wait. But we have nope. free 15 gigabytes, but we don't have those things. Um, we might have those things soon. SpaceX lo- rocket launch was very cool. Yeah, it was. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, did you watch like the entire 18 hours? I did not watch the entire 18 hours. He's not a real fan. I watched the launch. I watched up to, so I got through like the reusable rocket came down and landed. You got Seco, second engine cut off. Uh, and then, you know, then they were just kind of vibing, just floating. Uh, and it began to look like, it was so cool. Like the internal, like with the monitors and stuff, like they had a flight tracker and I'm like, that looks like flight tracker from like when I'm on an airplane, which was just so interesting. Uh, and so, you know, I got to the point where they're just kind of drifting and they're kind of waiting to intersect with the international space station. And so I'm like, okay. I'll stop for today. And then today when I woke up at 10, they were just docking. And it was pretty cool. They docked with the International Space Station. And it took them forever to get onto the space station, but it was pretty cool. Um, and so yeah, it's it's fun. It was pretty it was just incredible. You, you gotta watch it. You gotta watch it back if you missed it. Um yeah, let's see. Great. But yeah, so quantum. Yeah, my computer, just yeah. just my local disc has 148 gigs on it. And that's not even the main one that I yeah. yeah. But I mean, as I said, you can buy like a terabyte hard drive for Yeah, like, it's insane. Like forty bucks maybe. You can get a eight gigabyte flash drive, fits in your pocket. Like yeah, that my, would be incredible. That would impress my me. main drive has two point twelve terabytes on this computer. Wow, that's that's so, quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah, it's that's quite definitely a light. Quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> um anyways. But yeah, so the way that quantum cryptography works is it relies on quantum mechanics and how, how quantum mechanics works. And it relies on the superposition. So basically, if your key gets to your intended recipient as planned with no spying, like no like attempts of like seeing your message, then it'll arrive as a superposition. And when you observe that superposition, it'll collapse. And so, like, you'll be like, okay, good. Like, this is fine. But if you send it and someone intercepts it, right, then they observe it and they collapse the superposition. And even if they were to, like, they're like, oh, okay, look at that key and, like, send it on, it's the superposition is already collapsed. So when you get it, you see, okay, someone obviously looked at this. It's, it's the, like, it's the quantum principle, like, the very act of observing something changes it, which is pretty interesting. It, that's quite a that's quite a big difference from like previous sort of cryptography because if you say send a letter to someone, you know your mailman or whatever can like get some if they're compromised they can get some like latex glove gloves, grab the letter, you know like carefully open it, like read it and be like oh I see, but then they can fold it back up and then mail it along, and you would have no idea, you know. Um, so you need like that's why they have like tamper proof seals and stuff like that. It's very important to have a sort of system where like if the security has been broken, you know it's been broken. And that's what quantum cryptography allows you to do. So if your key has been broken, then you're like, "All right, we got to make a new key because this one has been compromised." And then you do that. And so it's it's pretty great. It's pretty interesting. Yeah. So that's kind of how it works. I am not a quantum scientist yet uh yes. <laughs> yeah i don't know physics of some sort but um but yeah so i don't know i don't know exactly how this works yet you know if you can like if you're really interested like do a deep dive but this is sort of the basics here uh so yeah that, that's it for me yeah you move right. on. so quick episode today you know final thoughts uh 
That was that was quick. That was fun. Mm -hmm. I okay. I have. I think I've been pretty hyped up today because I had like a frappuccino. I know that sounds very bourgeoisie. However, wow. Let's just let's put it better. I had a coffee like a few hours ago. I usually don't drink caffeinated beverages, so I've been talking quicker. I've noticed. I've been very bouncy. Um, but yeah, so this was a fun episode. We got through it fairly quickly, only like an hour yep. ten ish. But you know, we had no guests. We had to kind of clamor. We gotta. We had to figure this out. Uh, but next week will be a very fun episode. I'm really excited for the topic because it's, really... it's not discussed a lot. It's um, it's a topic that like you never really see. So it's gonna be fun. Um, and we'll have our guest. He's gonna be fun. He yep. was kind of a guest today. Uh, he made an appearance in the chat. Um, he did. So yeah. So I would like to thank you, Sebastian, for being my co-host as always. And as always, I would like to thank you guys all for watching this episode. And I hope you guys learned something about encryption. I hope you are enjoying your day. Uh, I hope you know something entertaining, right? Hopefully, this is edutainment. If you've heard that horrible word, honestly, terrible. <laughs> um, but what else? Let's see. Um, uh, Oh, yeah. Uh, okay, I can't remember what else I was saying. So I'm just gonna He's it. lost it, gents, ladies and gentlemen. Coffee? He's lost it. Yeah. Yeah, all right. Should I, should I end the stream? Anything else left to say? Like, thank you guys all for watching. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. I hope you guys watched that SpaceX. That was a historic. Saturday was a historic day, really. Um, it was. So, yeah. I'm going to end it there. Uh, we'll see yeah. you guys on Sunday next week. It'll be June. That's fun. We'll finally, well, it won't be summer because the solstice, but, you know, another month passes. Uh, so, yeah, I'll see you guys all next time, and goodbye.